Hello, Crossing Church. It's good to see you. How are you doing? Are you doing okay? What a beautiful day. God is just, uh, it's amazing the days that God creates and that we get to live in them and enjoy them. And, uh, and uh, it's just, that's just so exciting. I want to welcome all of our campuses that are joining us. Uh, Kirksville, glad that you're joining. Macomb, so many awesome things happen there. And we're so glad that you're joining as well. Pittsfield and Hannibal joining us. And uh, 929, we are just excited that uh, all of you are joining us. 929 uh, actually put a big screen uh, on the side of their building this week and had a drive-in theater. I mean, it's awesome the different things that uh, people come up with, like 75 people sitting out there on the lawn uh, watching a movie. Uh, that's pretty neat. Lots of great things going on. Now, this series, I don't know about you, but this series is working me over. Uh, every time I prepare a new sermon, I'm, I'm uh, you know, this is, it's hard for me to hear it. It's hard for me to think about what I'm going to be talking about because it just keeps going deeper and deeper into more and more tender places in my heart. And I don't know if it's doing that to you as well, but uh, just hang in there because I really want to be what this series is about. I don't want to be a fan. I want to be a follower. And I need to know what that looks like. I need to know what God's expectations are. I need to learn how to come into compliance with those and be the kind of person he wants me to be, do the kind of things he wants me to do. You know, we talked in the first week about being a fan or being a follower. We just talked about what does that mean? How do you define that? What's the difference between the two? And maybe as soon as that first uh, sermon Uh, Many of us were going, wow, I'm way too much of a fan and I need to move over and be uh, the kind of follower that Christ wants me to be. In the second week, we talked about choosing intimacy and what that really means to be in an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, Last week, we talked about living in denial, denial of one's self. And some of the things we touched on uh, last week were pretty in your face. You can't call Jesus your Lord unless you're declaring yourself to be a slave. Those two words actually go together in the Greek language. Uh, The word kurios and the word doulos. Lord, slave. That's really what's happening. I mean, when we start thinking about that, it's going to challenge us in many ways. And living in denial means letting go. Living in denial means whatever's in your arms and in your hands, what you're going to do is you're going to lay it down. All of the things that uh, comprise your agenda, your priorities, your life, your aspirations, your hopes and your dreams, everything that you can have and, and some of us are walking in here and if we could see what we really look like with all of that, you know, we're the kind of people that are just holding one thing too many. It just keeps, things just keep falling out. When what God wants us to do is lay it all down. He wants to lay it wants us to lay it all down, everything down. Why? So that our hands are free, so that our arms are free, so that we can pick up what he wants us to pick up. And I'm going to refer you back to the scripture that we're really honing in on in these last three weeks. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and what? And follow me. So last week we talked about what it means to deny yourself, to live in self-denial. And that is putting all of these things down. And when we do, we put them down, we lay them at the foot of the cross, then our arms are free to embrace Christ. And if we're going to embrace Christ, what does that actually look like? If we're going to embrace Christ, we're going to embrace the cross, right? Because that's what he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's what Christ wants us to carry. So what is it? What is the cross? And I know that that sounds like an easy statement to answer, an easy question to answer. But today, the cross is more of a symbol than anything else. Some of you at uh, our locations right now are wearing them. 
You may be wearing the cross around your neck. You may be, uh, have some uh, earrings made with the cross. You may have uh, a cross symbol on a ring. Uh, you may have a cross tattooed on your skin somewhere. Uh, you, you could have a cross al- almost anywhere because we wear them as, uh, as for symbols. And, you know, in that symbolic nature, for so many of us, the cross has really lost its meaning, hasn't it? Because as a symbol, the cross really isn't about jewelry. Because the cross represents something as a symbol, but it really isn't something that we would consider beautiful unless we understood what it, that emanates from. And this is what emanates from the cross symbolically. Three things, ready? Suffering, humiliation, and death. I want you to say those with me. All of our locations. Here's the first one. Suffering. Did you get that? Suffering. Suffering. Humiliation. Humiliation. And death. I mean, who likes that stuff? Yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to wear that as, as jewelry. Uh, I, I want to I tattoo that on my, on my body. I want to tattoo a symbol of suffering, humiliation, and death. Because that is exactly what the cross represents. It represents those three things. You know, the cross wasn't about killing people. It really wasn't about killing people. Even though ultimately it represents death, it wasn't about that. Think about this. The Roman government... Was, they were the ones who created crucifixion the way we see it in the life of Christ. Okay, Why did they create that? So they could kill people? Absolutely not. There's a lot easier ways to kill people. I mean, you can just run them through with a sword. You can cut off their head. You can make them drink poison. You can take them out and throw them off of a cliff. You can stone them to death. You can do all sorts of things that we even see biblically that they used to execute people. Why? A cross. Do you know that in order to crucify a person, you had to have five Roman soldiers, four soldiers and a centurion. You had to have four soldiers to do the execution and a centurion to oversee the execution. Five soldiers. And usually, a crucifixion could take more than a day. A person could be up on the cross a long time. And the entire time that that person was on the cross, that detachment of soldiers was there. So why would they do that? Why would they spend all of that money and all of that time in order to kill a person? Because it wasn't about killing a person. It was about making an example out of a person. It was about humiliating a person. It was about making them suffer as much as possible and to show the world this is what happens to you when you defy the Roman government. It was meant as an example. It was an expensive example, but the Romans considered it worth it because it enabled them to have the fear of everyone else. So if the cross is a symbol of suffering and humiliation and death, and that is what Jesus is telling me to pick up, what does that mean in my life? If I'm going to be a follower of Christ, because you know that's how this statement ends in Luke 9, 23, to be a follower of Christ, and it requires me to pick up the cross, what is that going to look like in my life? Is he just saying that because it sounds poetic? Or is there some real truth in what it means to pick up the cross? First of all, let's drill down on the idea of suffering, okay? If the cross is a symbol of suffering, what Jesus is saying to his would-be followers is, if you want to follow me, if you would, if you would want to come after me, you have to deny yourself, get your hands and your arms empty, and then pick up suffering. Pick up the cross, which means pick up suffering. Now, what kind of suffering? Because a lot of people, as Christians, a lot of people want to claim this, that suffering is the cross, or all suffering is the cross. That's just not true, okay? I want to dispel that myth. Somebody's got cancer, so they go, 
then I'm suffering for Christ or I'm picking up my cross because I'm dealing with cancer. No, you're not. No, you're not. The cancer is not the suffering of the cross. Maybe you're dealing with uh, some issue at work or you're dealing with an issue in a relationship or you're dealing with something that's causing you grief or difficulty. You know what? That happens in this world. This is a cursed world. It's not a cursed on account of God. It's a cursed on account of us. Because, because we violated God's law and God cursed the ground instead of Adam. Says that in the book of Genesis. And so sin entered the world and death as a result of sin and the suffering that accompanies that because of that sin that entered the world. And that's our responsibility, okay? So that's just life. There's a lot of suffering that happens just because you're alive, the Bible says that it rains on the righteous and on the unrighteous. That means that we all get a turn, that, that, that we all share in that kind of general sense of suffering. But when we talk about the cross of Christ and suffering, picking up the cross and connecting that to suffering, it's completely different. The suffering that I'm talking about is in direct relationship to our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's suffering because of the name of Jesus Christ. It's suffering because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of us would want to claim suffering and claim it from, and I'm saying you can glorify God in the midst of suffering, and that's great. But when you say or claim that whatever suffering you have, that's the cross of Christ, that's really not true. And Jesus explains it uh, in Luke 6.22. And we're going to go there. But I want to make sure that you have this understood, that we don't dilute the, we don't dilute the cross, okay? Because I think sometimes we dilute it. We try to water down the cross and we make it palatable for us. So we try to make our lives as they presently are fit the cross rather than understanding the cross and making our lives fit into what Jesus calls us to when it comes to the cross. There was a man by the name of Robert Courtney, a pharmacist. Anybody of you heard of Robert Courtney, the pharmacist? Really interesting story. See, Robert Courtney was a pharmacist who dispensed chemotherapy drugs. And over a period of nine years, he found out that he could dilute those chemotherapy drugs. He actually bought them on the gray market, so he was making money off, of, off the chemotherapy drugs, and then he would dilute those chemotherapy drugs down. He did it for 98,000 prescriptions. People that were receiving chemotherapy drugs from Robert Courtney, 98,000 times he diluted it down for 4,200 patients. At least 17 people died as a direct result of the dilution of those chemotherapy drugs. And Robert Courtney, until he was caught, pocketed $19 million. But you know, a diluted chemotherapy drug is not what you want because that's not what's going to make you better. And those of us that have had to deal with cancer in our families or in our personal lives, our own lives, realize that chemotherapy is not something that you're going to line up for if they're handing it out free, right? You're not going to say free chemotherapy. Oh, I want to go. No, you don't want that unless you're dealing with cancer. And then if you're dealing with cancer, even though you would maybe be fearful and not want to deal with that, not want to take that chemotherapy, you will because hopefully it'll kill the cancer before it kills you, right? Because you need strong medicine, really strong medicine. We don't want to dilute down the cross. Listen, when it comes to the cross, you and I, we need strong medicine, we need to have what Christ can provide, and we need it in its full strength. We don't need to be diluting it down or making it palatable or making it easy. We need to hear what Christ has to say and follow it, okay? So the cross is a symbol of suffering. In Luke chapter 6, verse 22, he specifically says what kind, okay? He says this, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you, and insult you, and scorn your name as evil 
for the sake of the Son of Man. Suffering for Christ means to be hated, excluded, insulted, rejected, falsely judged, all because of Christ. Now is that what any of us are dealing with? The second form or the, the second piece of the symbolic piece of the cross is humiliation. And really, humiliation drills down on suffering. It's kind of like saying this is the specific kind of suffering that you're going to deal with. You're going to be dealing with humiliation. And humiliation can move from the emotional and the psychological into the physical. So we might be in an environment right now where... Uh, like, like on television right now in America, usually people that claim to be evangelical Christians that are uh, portrayed on television are usually uh, uh, pictured as buffoons or clowns, right? And people that are living as worldly as possible are the coolest people. I mean, the Charlie Sheens of the world are the ones everybody wants to be like. What's well, really strange? But the people that are really living their lives for Christ, those are the ones that in this world are starting to be considered odd. Speaking up for the word of God right now in the country of Canada, speaking up for the word of God in specific social issues will get you put in jail for a hate crime. So they are in Canada right now, right now, they're regulating what people can say in the pulpit and if you declare something to be wrong or a sin, you can and people have gone to jail for that. So if that's happening in Canada, how far is it from happening in America? You know, you might, you might right now be, be thankful that you're living in a country where you can profess Christ and you won't be hated and excluded and insulted and rejected and falsely judged. But uh, don't hold your breath. Because things are changing, and they've been changing. And sometimes the church is asleep in the light, you know what I mean? And sometimes that kind of emotional and psychological abuse can become physical. Last week, I had a friend here, Kevin Dooley. Kevin and, and I have been friends since uh, high school, but even before, we both went to Bible college. And uh, he became a missionary, and he was a missionary in Panama for 10 years, and then he went to Wheaton and got a master's degree. Uh, he's done stuff with uh, people that are incarcerated. And here, most recently, he's been working in Morocco uh, with uh, Muslims in, in Morocco and doing uh, businesses evangelism in Morocco. And he's, he was put blacklisted in Morocco, and he's thrown out of Morocco. And now he's in Spain and in America, both of those places, still has that ministry going on in Morocco, uh, but also does work from Spain, people that are able to go into Morocco, and uh, uh, does stuff stateside with taxi drivers, Islamic, ta uh, Muslim taxi drivers in Indianapolis, does some really awesome stuff. But uh, I remember Kevin, and he doesn't, he doesn't print this, and he doesn't tell you stories because he doesn't want to sensationalize it, but he had his kids you know, and his wife living in Fez, Morocco with him for four years. And uh, the people would defecate and then they would throw their defecation at them. Every morning they would have to, they had, they had a, a, a wall around their house and every morning they would have to clean up. Because that was the kind of intimidation that they, they dealt with on a daily basis. That she couldn't walk outside of her house without someone to protect her. That was their life for four years. How many of us would embrace something like that? The cross is a symbol of suffering. It's a symbol of humiliation. And suffering 
Humiliation, listen to this, suffering humiliation can often come at the very beginning of our faith. You would think that, well, you know, when I grow up enough in my faith, then eventually I'll have to deal with this. You know, maybe uh, if, if I become a person who wants to share my faith with others, this could happen or that could happen or something else could happen. No, actually, the humiliation that we deal with usually is right on the front end of our faith because as soon as a person accepts Christ, they're accepting Christ in a, in a foreign context, right? Because like the, if, they, if you came out of the world and into Christ, all the people you know, people you hang out with, all of that, they're not going to agree with that. And if you start professing your faith as soon as you get it, what are they going to do? What are they going to say to you? How are they going to deal with that? And then how are you going to deal with how they deal with that? I mean, it's going to be tough. I get so sick and tired of pastors who, who get up in front of churches and they tell people, if you accept Christ, then everything in your life is going to get great. They'll actually they'll lie to people and they'll say that. And I know on a spiritual level that's true and it is the pathway. It's the right way to go and it's worth it. I get all that, you know. But let me tell you something. If you accept Jesus Christ in your life, it's going to be hard unless you accept some deluded, milk toast, two-dimensional, fake plastic Jesus. If you accept the real Jesus and you get in a relationship with the real Jesus, he is going to take a wrecking ball to your life. He's going to tear it down and he's going to build up something that he wants. You know, people say at the crossing, we water down the gospel. I wonder what sermon they're hearing. Is there like a sermon out there? Because I just don't know if, how many people are out there preaching today, if you want to follow Jesus Christ, come and die. But that's what the cross says. That's what taking up the cross means, to, to suffer, and to suffer even humiliation and to the point of death. You see, death is the inevitable result of suffering on the cross. And Jesus showed that in 3D. This is what it looks like. But what does that look like for you? And what does that look like for me? The Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20 said this, I am crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live to God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, from now on, my life belongs to him. And he can use it however he sees fit. And I am trusting him, remember, as my Lord. Trusting him to know that he loves me and he will take care of me. And so I die to myself and I live for him. How do I actually do that though, okay? I think you're hearing what I'm saying, but... How do, I, how do I actually accomplish this? Is this like something that I just make up my mind and, and okay, God, now I'm really going to do it? You know, what we end up doing is we put a bunch of to-dos on this. Like, uh, like okay, if, if I believe uh, that I need to die to myself, what that means, I need to, I need to give a certain amount of money away. Or uh, I get, need to give it to the church, or I need to go give it to the poor, or I need to go uh, invest in a homeless shelter, or I need to, you know, some type of social justice, maybe that's connected to something spiritual. I need to go give my money away. Or maybe I'm thinking, well, I, I need to go give my time. I need to go do this and, and do that. I need to go volunteer at a place. Or, and, and let me tell you, all those things are great. All those things are great. I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I'm saying... It isn't about what you do. Taking up the cross is not about what you do, as if doing something is what God wants. He wants you to be something. He wants you to be something, and what you do should emanate from who you are. So what God wants to do is he wants to change the substance of who you are. He wants to change the substance of who I am. 
He wants to change my identity. And then all of those things that we do will just flow out of this new identity. So how do you view yourself right now? You see, that's really what the question of the whole series is about. Am I a fan or am I a follower? How do I view myself? Am I viewing myself as a follower, but I'm really faking myself out because I'm really a fan? I'm really an enthusiastic fan who likes to make everybody else think that I'm a follower? Or am I truly a follower? I mean, am I really in to Jesus? Am I... Am I in his word? Am I talking to him on a regular basis? Am I dropping to my knees on a regular basis? Am I living because I love him? Living in him because I love him? Because if I do that, it teaches me how to view myself. And if I view myself properly, then it's going to change the things that I do. I'll bear fruit in my life. How do I view the world? Right now, how do you view the world? Do you see the world as something that you really not, don't really care about? Like your world, you could draw a really small circle around it, like just your family, or, or, or you know, just around your house and a few immediate friends. Is that your world? You know, I know churches that that's what they're about. I know churches that their world is that church. And they want to take care of each other. They want to do everything for each other. And I'm going, well, that's nice, but that's not the worldview that Jesus Christ gave us, right? Jesus so, God so loved his close personal friends that he gave his only begotten son, right? He said he loved the whole world. He loved the whole world. What, what kind of people in the world? People that didn't even care about him. People that crucified him. People that despised him. Those are the people that he loved. He loved us all. He loves us all. So I have to have the same worldview that he does. I, can't, I don't have the, the pleasure of drawing this little teeny circle around me and my family, my close personal friends. It's got to be the whole world. How do I view myself? How do I view the world? And through that, what kind of decisions do I make? Where are my priorities? You see, all of those things will flow out if there's something that's changed on the inside of me and I'm becoming dead to myself and alive to Christ. You know, some of us, we just don't do it. I mean, some of us, we just, we just don't want our heart changed that way and so we keep our little circle and, you know, our, our little you know, comfort zone and we don't want anybody like getting into that. But then there's others of us that are even more hypocritical because we talk about it, but don't do it at all. I know there's people that have all the speak, you know, they talk the Bible, they use big three and four syllable words and man, they study and study and study. But when it comes down to actually living it out every single day, they don't show up. Oh man, they, they look great. They talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, the Apostle Paul says this, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. In the NIV it says, it is not a matter of talk. Some of us, we talk a great game. We are great at armchair quarterbacking, but when it actually comes to how I view myself and what proceeds out of that, how I view the world and what proceeds out of that, we're totally different than that. And so what we become is spiritual posers. I mean, we don't live it. Or become it. So what am I to do? You know what it says? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Take up his cross. Take up his cross. This is, you know, Jesus' cross wasn't taken up. Or it was, didn't appear to be taken up. It, it appeared to be forced upon him, right? I mean, he was pushed. That, that cross was, was, was put on his back and he was whipped and forced up a hill, Right? But do you know what Jesus said? He goes, no one takes my life from me. Right? I lay it down willingly. 
So even though it appeared that it was being forced on him, it really wasn't. It was something that he was taking up. He didn't have to go through any of that. I remember an old hymn I used to sing when I was a kid. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. And I hear what Jesus says to me in Luke 9, 23, and he says, this isn't something I'm going to force on you. Here's something for you to pick up. The cross is not something that God lays on your back. It's something that you pick up. Take up your cross. And he says how to take it up. This is an important word. We, we, sometimes we go right over it, but this is an important word. Take up his cross, what? Daily, daily, daily. Why does he say daily? I'll tell you why. Because my views, my priorities, and my decisions, and my actions that flow out of those priorities and views and decisions have to be reviewed and renewed every day. That's how inconsistent I am. That's how hypocritical I am. And that's how hypocritical and inconsistent you are. So every day, we have to be reviewing this. You know what? Some of you have been Christians for 30 years. That means for 30 years, every day, you've been reviewing this, right? You've been looking at your life critically. You've been reviewing and renewing. And so this whole idea of carrying the cross, wow, you must be awesome at it. Shame on those of us that have been Christians for so many years and have the kind of example that we have to show newer believers. This is a hard teaching. And you're probably feeling like you're getting a beating right now. Yeah, I know. But... This is what Luke 9.23 says. And this is what it means to be a follower. And I'm not going to put icing on it to make it better. I mean, a cross with icing on it, somebody probably made it. Jesus says this in Luke uh, uh, Luke 9.24, right after Luke 9.23. And it really wraps it up. It says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He is the one who will save it. You know what we find is that when when we die to ourselves, what we find on the other side of that death, that daily death, Picking up the cross is something so much greater, so much greater than what we laid down. That's the truth. Look at Jesus. Look at what he laid down and then look at what he took back up. I think of Jesus when he came to this earth and what he was able to do, the amazing things. But when he laid down his life and he died and he rose from the dead, he took his life back up again. If he tried to save his life, he didn't. He gave it up. But because he gave up his life, he was raised from the dead. And he had a glorified body. And he was so much more, even on earth, than he had been previously. And when we die to ourselves, we become so much more. And the bottom line is, we're all going to die anyway, right? We're all going to die anyway. So why die for nothing when you can die for something? Why die for nothing when you can die for someone who died for you? And prove by dying for you that he has the power to raise you from death back into life. So that you can have that knowledge that if I die for him... He will raise me back up to life. 
so that I can agree with what he said at a cemetery one day when he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. And a person who lives and believes in me will never die. When we die to ourselves, we truly find out what it means to live. If you'll deny yourself and drop your life and your world down at the foot of the cross and then find a cross there that you can pick up and carry every day for the Lord Jesus, you have begun to find what real life is all about. That's exciting. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you say, well, I don't know, Jerry, what you're saying is kind of scaring me. Well, I've never known a moment in my life, not one moment since I have been in Christ that I carried a burden alone. We're moving to a time of decision.